heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful privilege where, Lord, we can gather together with one purpose to give glory, honor, and praise unto you, Father, and to confess our common faith, and Lord, to celebrate the gift of salvation that you have given to us, Father. And Lord, as we sit at your feet right now, I pray that, Lord, our ears will be attentive, our hearts ready to receive, and our whole being, Father, respond in obedience to your word, Father. Speak to us, and Lord, let there be transformations in the area where, Lord, it is required. And Father, that Lord, to know that the faith that you have given us is not a passive, but an active faith that moves in increasing steps of obedience. So Father, help us, Lord, to use this beautiful gift that you have blessed us with. Lord, to become Christ-like on a daily basis in our lives. Lord, empower us, fill us with your spirit, Lord, we pray. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us open in our Bibles to James chapter 2. Our text portion today is verses 14 to 26. And uh, I'm reading from the ESV version. That's what's put up on the screen. So let's read together. What good is it, my brothers, if one, someone says he has faith but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from work is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. The central message of James, uh, we talked in the first um, message that we had from this book, I uh, introduced James to you as a, and he had many nicknames, James the Just, James the Bulwark, you know, and he had many beautiful names because of his character as a man of God. He was a solid man of God. And the central message of the solid man of God, James, is that those who are truly saved through the gospel manifest their faith in action. Um, it is a sad situation, actually, that uh, in the modern age, the gospel of Jesus is presented as a gospel of love, which it is, but it stops over there and it is not presented as the gospel of grace that comes freely from God, and it is not presented as a gospel of righteousness. You know, do you know that you cannot love the hell out of a person? You can only, only the the righteous fear of God can scare the hell out of a person. <laughs> so many times we, we give a soft peddled gospel to people and we expect you know, that gospel to transform. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of righteousness. And then it is the gospel of love. The central message of James what is that central message? That those who are truly saved through the gospel will manifest their faith in action. And therefore, faith is not 
a passive word. It is active. It is a verb. It has action built into it. Now, there is one portion in the Bible, if you go and study the book of Romans, where Paul is now preaching about salvation through faith. And there, you can, if you read through those portions in Romans, you, you can, especially when you come to chapter 3 and 4, you may think that, oh my goodness, there is a contradiction here. Paul and James are contradicting each other because Paul says that you are saved by faith. And some people have added a word to that, faith alone. There's a verse in Romans chapter 3 verse 28 which kind of sums up what Paul was saying and says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now the contradiction is superficial. It is the way we understand it. And the contradiction happens in the word works. Because the word works that Paul uses is a different word from what James uses. James uses the works from the point of view of ergon, which is a Greek word which talks about action. Whereas Paul talks about the works that is related with the works of the law. So what Paul is trying to say to his audience is that, look... You are trying to do good works. And by the way, this is not talking about good works. It is talking about action in James. Now Paul is trying to tell his audience that, look, you are trying to earn your salvation through good works. And you are never ever going to earn your salvation through your good works because it just takes you to break one law to become a lawbreaker. So it doesn't matter how much of goodness that you you have done with your efforts but the moment that you break one of laws one of god's commands you become a lawbreaker and therefore there is no one that's why the bible tells us there is none righteous with our efforts if you can imagine a, a grasshopper that is contained in a container the grasshopper can only jump as high as the ceiling that is posed upon its life. And that is our works. Our works always fall short. The intents may be good, but they sincerely fall short of what is required for the remission of sin. And so Paul is talking from that point of view that there, there is no good works that you can do. There is no quantum of good works that you can do that will justify you to receive your salvation. So basically, you cannot earn your salvation. So Paul is using that word works from the point of view of works of law that you are trying to get brownie points by obeying them in order for you to be justified. Justification comes as a gift from God because we do not have it in us to bridge that gap and to pay the price to the depths by which we have fallen through sin, we do not have the capacity, we do not have the strength, we do not have the capabilities to pay that price. It is only God and God alone who can pay that price and he freely did that by sending his only begotten son and him taking up his place in the cross, taking the Lord of our filth upon him. Jesus was willing to take the filth of our sins upon himself. And for that moment he dreaded the most was the moment when his father would turn his face away from him and total darkness would come upon Jesus. He dreaded that and that is why he cried out in the garden of Gethsemane that if this cup may pass from me, may it be so, but yet let your will be done, not mine. He dreaded that moment tremendously when he had to carry the filth of our sin. And our sin is so gruesome, it is so filthy that the Father had to turn his face. Heaven had to turn its face away from... That was the most lonely moment in Jesus' life. When he was all on his own carrying the filth of our sin. And that's how gruesome our sin is. So there is no contradiction between Paul's exposition in Romans or James's exposition in, in, uh, in James because they are coming from two different angles, talking about two different things. Paul is talking about justification and, uh, and uh, James is talking about 
the fact that your faith is not a passive word, it is an active word. So your faith is not producing, uh, good works are not, works are not products of your faith, but it goes hand in hand with your faith. It is built in with the characteristic of faith that faith has to act out. James speaks of works, not in sense of fruit, but action of the faith. And James does not contradict Paul, but the distortion by people of what Paul said because people added a word which Paul never stated. They said, faith alone, sola fide. That's a mistake. You know, there is a group of people who took that understanding, sola fide, and said that salvation is the, is the total responsibility of God. So you had two schools of thoughts. You had Augustine, one of the church fathers, who was the first one to take this stand and actually who brought a major error into the church. He said, you and I don't have a choice. If we are chosen by God, we are chosen by God. If not, we are not. So it's not in our hands at all. There is nothing that we can do. It is totally God. And he alone is the one responsible for our salvation. You and I uh, have nothing to do with it. On the other hand, there was Pelagius who, who came up with the understanding that no, it is not God alone. You and I have a part to play. And the part that you and I have to play is the part of, of uh, working out our salvation. So there were two extreme views, but the right view, the biblical view is right in the middle of this, that yes, it is God who saves, he alone who can save, but God will not save you until you cooperate with him. And so faith has to act in itself. What is the action that is required for justification to take place? Because there is no way that you will get saved if you stand in the place of arrogance, if you don't humble yourself, if you don't repent, and repentance is an action of faith for justification. So there is a part that God plays, and there is a part that we play. I have given this illustration before that imagine that you are drowning in water. You do not know how to swim, and the currents are getting the better of you. And then somebody standing on a solid ground throws you a lifeline and says, grab on to it. And so you grab on to that, and the person standing on the solid ground pulls you out from your precarious situation. This is the picture of salvation in its full action. So there is an action that we have to do. The action that we have to do is we have to hold on. Now, if we continue to say that, no, I, by faith, I'm not going to hold the rope. I'm not going to grab the lifeline that's being given to me. And by faith, I will be saved. That person is going to drown because that faith is not taking action. The action has to be taken. So there is a partnership right here. The ability is with God. But the, but the desire to be saved and the action to hold on to the lifeline is ours. So there is an action right there. There is a work that faith produces. Faith has to produce even for us to be saved. So sadly, one of the five tenets of evangelical Christianity stands on error. Sola fide. Paul never said faith alone. Because when Paul talks about faith, he already knows there is action built with faith. So there are two kinds of beliefs that you need to understand that can happen right here. Belief number one is to accept a fact without allowing it to have any influence upon our life. For example, for those who have studied physics, I'll just use a, a, an equation. S is equal to ut plus half at squared is an equation that calculates distance based on parameters of velocity and time and acceleration. Now, you may know this as a fact, but it may have absolutely zero impact upon your life. You may have learned this. You may have answered questions based on this, but your day-to-day -day life... Really, you don't care about it. The belief number two is taking the belief in Christ into each and every aspect of life and actually live a transformed life by it. And that 
is what James is talking about. Another example I want to give you is that very clearly printed on every cigarette pack is the warning, cigarette smoking is injurious to health. So if you are a person on the category one, belief one, you will see that, you will read that, you know about it, but you'll continue to read, uh, to smoke pack after pack of cigarettes knowing that it is injurious to health. But the other person, other category of people is they will see that warning, they will read it, they will understand it, and they will go through transformation and they will make a decision that I shall not smoke hereafter. And they stick to their commitment. How much ever the craving for nicotine screams out from our body, but they have made a, they will find ways to overcome that addiction. So we have to decide, you know, we, we, we have been given this poor, pathetic picture that Christian life is just that you, you just need to plug in into a stream and then you just cruise along. Christian life is not a life on a cruise ship. Christian life is a life on battleship. I quote Pastor Gerald here. <laughs> it is a life on battleship. Speak and span, ready for action at any moment. It is constant action, prepared for action. Now let's go to verses 14 to 17. Let me read that again. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, lacking in daily food, one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, that's one of the most standard things that we do. Somebody we know is in need, what do we do? We lay hands and pray and say, God bless you. Give a kiss and off you go. And that person who came with the need goes back with the need Expression of sympathy by mere words does not minister to a person whose need is greater than empathy towards their plight. Converting sympathy to action is costly, yet that is what ministers. I remember, I'll tell you a story from what happened some years back to us. Um, I had taken a couple of youth from our church in Dar Salaam Pentecostal Church. I took a couple of them on a, on a mission trip with me to go and uh, do some uh, evangelism in a, in a far off village in the interiors. Um, and so we were associated with a Assemblies of God church in that locality in a village. So it was a village church. And so we were there for a few days. And one day in the evening that we were having this meeting and, uh, and after the teaching session, as we were all about to leave, we tried to push the door open. The door wouldn't open. Why? Because there was someone lying across the door on the outside. And we had to jump out of the window, carry this person, you know, and this person had fainted. Now the story is that this person had actually come for the meeting. This person was so sick and he's, he, he stays... Um, number of miles away from the where, the where the meeting was taking place. And this is how it happens in the village. People come from long distance walking. And so this person is sick, running a very high fever, weak, and yet this person is making it to the church meeting because once he wants to be filled with the presence of God and to receive instructions from the word of God. What a wonderful desire. So anyway, this person walks through the, through the chill of the evening, comes and falls, faints and falls across the door. So the first thing that we do as a church is we pray. That's the first thing we always do. And, and prayers of righteous man, praise God for that. And then we said, we, we took the person it was completely dehydrated. We took the person to the clinic, the village clinic, which is very basic, and uh, put the person there and for treatment. And then we went back home 
to prepare food so that we could bring food back to this person. So we came back and by that time, you know, the time of visitors was over. It was dark. There's no electricity in the village. And so we sent one of our brothers, Bartholomew, we sent him in <laughs> uh, and, and he goes with the food and he goes and sits with the sick person. It is dark and then, you know, they minister, they can hardly see each other's and the, the sick person eats food and, and Bartholomew prays with the guy comes back and then as we were just about to leave we said which room did you go to he said we went I went to the first room I said no our guy is in the second room <laughs> so we had to go back home again prepare more food come back and minister to our patient but praise God the patient in the first room got saved as a result <laughs> as a result of Bartholomew's ministry to to him so it is not enough many times you know this is what we do we just we just say good words and we send the person off but ministry is costly it'll cost you your time it'll cost you energy it'll cost you discomfort it'll, it'll bring discomfort to you it'll cost you resources but that is well what faith is all about faith is accompanied with action immediately. It is not that works follow faith. Work is not a product of faith, but work is built in together with faith. The word faith is a verb, and a verb is action. So um, let's go to verses 18 to 19 now. Let's read that together in your Bibles if you follow with me. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show, sorry, I'm reading the wrong, wrong portion, am I? Yes. Verse 17. Right. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Do you believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now, faith and works are not alternative. They are not alternative expressions of Christianity. They are complementary expressions of Christianity. They go together. So actionless good intentions and thoughtless actions are equally meaningless and equates us to demons. This is what demons do. Actionless good intentions and thoughtless actions are equally meaningless and equates us to demons. Because even the demons believe. And they shudder. They are scared. They are spit scared. They know the fact that God is God and that he is awesome and holy. But they don't take the rightful action of repentance and of submission and of transformation. And therefore, if we say we have faith and we have no works in our lives, then it's a contradiction. And we are walking hand in hand with demons. And that is a scary place to be as a Christian. Let's go to verses 20 to 26 now. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way for as the body apart from the spirit is dead so also faith apart from works is dead I, I really hope the Holy Spirit ministers and speaks to you today you know and it's interesting Paul uses the same example he uses the example of Abraham in Romans chapter 3 and 4 and says that Abraham is justified by faith, not by works. But remember, Paul is talking about works of law, 
works that we try to do in our own strength. James is talking about works, the actions that accompany faith. And so there is no contradiction here. It is just the angle from which they are coming and what they are speaking to their audience and what the audience has to understand from what they are saying. And so Abraham and Rehab are examples of true demonstration of faith that took action. So they had faith and they took action based on that faith. Rehab did not say, okay, come, you know, and God bless you and go. And, and, and she, because she took an action, in her ancestry came people like Jeremiah the prophet and others, blessed people in her ancestry. She was a person from a Gentile background. Now look at this, even in the Old Testamental time, God is showing us very clearly that his plan of salvation is not confined to a race and to a certain group of people, but that it overflows, that, that people that were chosen were chosen as a model so that God could demonstrate to the entire world how it is to relate with him and how the blessings will overflow from that and touch and wherever that picture that Ezekiel gave about the streams that were flowing out in the desert and wherever the streams went, there was a garden that came up that flourished and that took, took root. That these blessings that are, that are planted and sown in, the blessings of salvation that are sown into your life is not confined to you. And that is why Matthew chapter 28 is very important because there is no secret believer. You cannot say, I am a believer and I hold that confession to myself. You cannot, because the moment you are a child of God, the moment you are a born again Christian, the great commission applies to you and the great commission is, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have taught you and lo, I am with you to the end of the ages. So the moment you are a born again Christian, that commission becomes yours and therefore there is no secret believers. Faith always has to act. You cannot contain it and say, I am a child of God. I have, I have a ticket. I'm heading for heaven. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, you know what? The story doesn't end there. You have to take others with you. You have to influence others around you. And you have the responsibility to preach. Now, the, the, the situation of many Christians today is that we live the gospel, but we don't preach the gospel. We affect the lives of people by our lives, but we do not make a spoken confession of our faith. And that is incomplete. Yes, you need to live the gospel, but you need to preach the gospel because to make disciples, you have to witness. Why were you and I empowered in the, in, in the Holy Spirit? Why did Jesus ask the disciples to go to Jerusalem upon his ascension? He said, go wait in Jerusalem and you will be empowered. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of God. He's going to empower you. Why? Not that you can manifest gifts, but so that you can be witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Your witness starts right in your immediate context in your home. You don't have a testimony in your home. You don't have a testimony at all. If you don't have a witness in your home, if you are not a witnessing Christian in your home, you don't have the right to witness anywhere else. It starts in your immediate context where God has placed you. And then it radiates from there to the other people that God has put in your circle of influence. And you are meant to touch every life that God puts in your path. You are meant to speak and confess and to witness the gospel through spoken words, through written words, and through actions of your life. And so don't just be mere, merely a lifestyle Christian but be also a Christian whose lifestyle is supported by spoken witness of the word of God. Faith and deeds are not separate, they are integral. No one is moved to action void of faith and no faith is genuine 
void of action. They are complementary one towards the other. And so I'm going to stop here today. And I'm going to leave this question as a reflection for all of us. Does the salvation that you received through the gospel of grace and righteousness of Christ manifest faith in action? Shall we stand up together? Let's take a moment to reflect. And the music team will lead us in a song that will... And as we, as we sing that song worshipfully, I pray that we reflect and actually make an adjustment today, mental adjustment that will lead to physical action. That no longer will I be a person who is passive in faith, but my faith that God has gifted to me. I'm going to take that gift. I'm going to act upon it. My life being transformed by it. And by, the, uh, by that action, lives of people around me are going to be transformed by it. Amen.